this night. Matthew said I could do this and put my stuff up here and be a little closer. Seems like there's a great gulf between us here. So I can get with you a little bit and talk to you a little bit. So I hope that'll be okay. Won't shake anybody up too bad. But uh, thank you all for inviting me to come. I really appreciate the opportunity and the invitation to, uh, to be with you this, uh, this weekend. We're going to pack a lot into a little and uh, say some things that I hope will be helpful, applicable, relevant to where we all live as we seek not only to serve God ourselves as, uh, as individuals and as moms and dads and grandmothers and grandfathers, but as we seek to do the same with our kids. Am I messing you up? Okay. There you go. What are you going to do when I walk over there? Oh, you're in trouble. Okay. I can't stay still. I read a statistic the other day. It said there's 7.4 billion people on planet Earth. And I learned something today. Approximately three and a half billion of them drive between Cincinnati and Dayton every afternoon at 5 o'clock. Wow, I hit uh, 75 and 275 in northern Kentucky right about 4.30. And I, did, I made a decision to go around. And I think that was a wise decision, even though uh, I think uh, several... Uh, thousand other people had made the same decision apparently but I came through Louisville today and and had lunch with my uh, dad and stepmother and they're both not in very good health and aging and so I had that opportunity to be with them and so uh, he said where are you going I said I'm going up to Kettering to Dayton he said what just a, a, a weekend meeting and I said yeah he said do you have a theme and I said parenting he said huh parenting what do you know about it? <laughs> he said, do you mind if I come and sit in the back so I can ask questions? He said, I've got some questions I'd like to ask you. I said, no, you're not welcome. <laughs> and he said, what makes you the expert on parenting? I said, because I'm from out of town. <laughs> that makes me the expert on parenting. <sighs> Thank you for the opportunity to talk to you about something that I think all of us struggle with. I know I struggle with it. And I'm not here to just say, okay, here's the answers to everything, because I don't have the answers to everything. In fact, on a lot of subjects, and this is one of them, sometimes I have more questions than I have answers. But God's been good to us. We've raised four, and they're all grown and married, three of whom live within an hour or two of us. Our youngest son, Luke, and his wife live in Kansas City, so it's a little bit of a drive for us to go visit and vice versa, but... Uh, uh, we rejoice in their lives, and, and they're all serving God, and we're so thankful for that. And then Julie and I, a couple years ago, maybe two and a half years ago, looked around our house, and we have a four-bedroom house, and all the rooms were empty. And we decided that either we would downsize, like a lot of people do at our age, or we would upsize the rooms and just add more kids. And so that's what we did. We went to Eastern Europe behind the old... Iron Curtain, and adopted three children from uh, uh, Bulgaria, which is ancient Macedonia in the Bible, and brought them to the States, and uh, uh, they've been with us now for two years. Leah is our oldest, she's 17, and Alex is uh, 15, and Christopher is 14. So we're starting the teenage roller coaster all over again, and yet with these kids, it's totally different. First of all, they're not our bio kids, but they're adopted children of trauma, which means Julie and I had to go back to school, at, literally, and learn a little bit about taking care of kids of trauma, because they all come from very traumatic backgrounds. They're siblings and grew up in an orphanage and spent all of their time there, and so you can, uh, you can only imagine the worst, and uh, it, would be, it would be true. So uh, we've made a lot of progress. And uh, Leah was baptized about a month ago. That was her decision. And uh, for the longest time when we first had these kids, she was the most outspoken. And she'd say, I don't believe there's a God. And uh, we'd be driving along in the car and she'd kind of throw that out there. You know, kids like to drop bombs on, you know, grenades. We'd be driving along and she'd say, I don't, I don't know that I believe there's a God. 
And I said, okay. Just kept driving. And a minute or two went by, and she said, that didn't make you mad? And I said, nope. Just kept driving. A couple minutes later, she said, well, maybe I really do. <laughs> so she's come a long way. All of them have come a long way. And uh, Julie and I are learning as we uh, embark upon this new uh, this new adventure of ours. Turn in your Bibles to the 90th Psalm. Let's start there. Psalm 90, verse 10. Psalm 90, verse 10. As for the days of our life, they contain 70 years, or if due to strength, 80 years, give or take. Yet their pride is but labor and sorrow, for soon it is gone and we fly away. Life is brief, he says. It, 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 it doesn't last that long. So verse 12, teach us to number our days that we may present to you a heart of wisdom. And that's what we want. We want to be able to present to God. We want to be able to present to others a heart of wisdom that we learn some things along the way that we can apply to our lives and in the process, apply to the lives of our children and help them. I'm going to go out on a limb here and guess that uh, you're a year older than you were last year. <laughs> and probably, if you're like my family, you've made another trip to the restaurant, you know, where servers gather around the table, and they sing off-key, and they pretend like they're enjoying it. <laughs> But for some of us, these birthdays are starting to pile up. And you thought the big 3-0 was tough, and then the big 4-0 came, and then the big 5-0 came, and then the big 6-0 came, and I'm going to stop there. But I decided I would take the Buzz Lightyear approach that simply says when it comes to aging to infinity and beyond, you know, it really doesn't matter. You see, the question is not where you are on the age range spectrum of life. That's not, that's not the question. The question is, what are you doing wherever you are on the age range spectrum of life? What are you doing now to capture significance? That's the question. It's not counting your days. It's making your days count for something bigger than you are. I think most people want a life that has meaning, that has purpose. A life that is more than just getting up every morning and putting your feet on the floor and going through the mundane minutia of just everyday living. I think people want a life more than that. But how? And where? And what? So let me recommend a book. It's this one. It's the one you have. The Bible will give you a reason to live. The Bible will give you clarity of purpose. The Bible will fuel your creativity. It will ignite your passion for life. And you will begin to live a life on purpose. Because you learn that the secret to living a happy life and a significant life is to live outside of yourself. Jesus said it's more blessed to give than to receive. Are we teaching our kids about that? Or are we letting our children be so influenced by culture because we've allowed culture to influence us? You know, in Matthew chapter 19, Jesus talked to a young man. Matthew chapter 19, beginning of verse 16. Someone came to Jesus and says, Teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may obtain eternal life? Now, before we say anything else about that, Give the man credit for coming to the right source and asking the right question. So Jesus said to him in verse 17, Why are you asking me about what is good? There's only one who is good. But if you wish to enter into life, keep the commandments. Do what God says. And he said to him, Which one? I always found that interesting. <laughs> Which one? What is this, a smorgasbord or a buffet line? What? Jesus said, Look. And he, he named several. Don't commit adultery, don't murder, don't steal, don't bear false witness, honor your father and mother, love your neighbors yourself. 
The young man said unto him, All these things I have kept, what am I still lacking? Really? He's done all these things? He's kept all of this? Jesus said to him, If you wish to be complete, go and sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. Why did Jesus tell him that? Because to that young man, life was all about self. And that's how a lot of people live. A lot of people have the mindset that says, I want it all, and I want it now, and I want it all, and I want it now for me. And so life becomes about fame and fortune and how many friends I can have on social media. That's what matters most. So let me ask you the question tonight. Is that that what we're communicating to our kids? Because if that's what we're communicating to our kids, then we have failed miserably. I put these thoughts together, and I I didn't have a really good title to come up with. I just called it Searching for Significance with with Our Children. Searching for Significance with Our Kids. Because that's when we talk about living a life on purpose and living a life of significance... That's what we have to communicate. And from the time our kids are very little, in their formative years, if we're not very careful, we can just automatically enroll them in the, in the rat race of culture, in the rat race of life. And so from the moment they walk into kindergarten, it's, it's, a, it's an automatic rat race. Because from that very moment, you got to make good grades. Because the American success formula is quite clear. You've got to have great grades to get into a great school, to get a great job, to have a great life. And nobody ever stops to ask the elephant in the room question. Why? What is the purpose of life? What is the purpose of life? There was a California student that made a perfect score on her SAT. Perfect score. Stanford University in Palo Alto, California, rolls out the red carpet. Full ride. And some reporter was interviewing this young lady, and he came up to her and he said, asked this very insightful question. What is the meaning of life? And this student who had the perfect score on her SAT turned to the reporter and said, I have no idea. I don't know. She didn't know. She didn't have a clue. But I'm going to tell you, most kids don't have a clue. Most kids don't know either. Because most of the kids' parents don't know. The purpose of the formative years of life is not from the get-go to make sure we get our kids in a great university. The, the purpose of the formative years of life is to help prepare our kids for life, to enable them to be able to answer the question, what is the purpose of life? Now, the purpose of life has different levels, obviously. One of the purposes of life, somebody could argue, is to help our children grow up and find meaningful work and something they're passionate about, something they're excited about, something that combines talent and opportunity and passion. And all. And as parents, we, we tend to know our kids pretty well. We may kind of guide them in one way or the other, and that's part of it. Or to find meaningful relationships to nurture and, and help our kids understand that people must come before profits and that relationships are more important than money and stuff and all of that. That's part of it. What is the purpose of life? Well, it's to find a cause to embrace, something that's bigger than you are, a way to give back to the world who is given to you. That's part of it too. But at the end of the day and at the end of life, the purpose of life comes down to Solomon's conclusion at the end of that journal in in which he tried out life and lived life with all the gusto you can imagine and did everything under the sun end he said the conclusion is what's the purpose of life he says fear God and keep his commandments do what God says because there's coming a day of accountability he 
your children know? Can they answer the question? Are you helping them understand what is the purpose of life? There's a passage in Micah 6 and verse 8. I'll, I'll let you get there. I know how it is. Matthew uh, calls out a verse in the Minor Prophets. Nobody bothers to turn there. Because by the time you find it, he's gone somewhere else. Micah 6 verse 8. Micah 6 verse 8. You know, there's, there's certain passages in the, in the prophets that just jump off the page. And this is one of them. Micah 6 and verse 8. He has told you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? What does God want from me? But to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. Where are our kids going to learn that? Where are they going to get that? Are they going to get that from their peers? Are they going to get that from social media? Are they going to get that from the American educational system? Is that where they're... Are they going to get that by sitting in a Bible class in a church building for an hour and a half a week? Is that where they're going to get that? Where are they going to get that? The average American kid spends seven hours a day plugged in. Did you know that? On average, spend seven hours a day to something plugged in. The average American teenager sends, I love this one, the average American teenager sends 3,147 text messages per month, over 100 per day. I think that's low. I think that's low. Our daughter Leah doesn't have a cell phone. She did, we tried that experiment, didn't work. So, she borrows mine, or she borrows uh, Julie's, and she's got a boyfriend at church, you know, and they're always, they're always texting one another, and uh, it's funny, to, I'll pick up my phone, when I go to bed, you know, and I'll check a message or two, and there was one last night that said, uh, love you, babe, so I wrote back, love you too, <laughs> Leah's dad, okay, <laughs> great, it is great, um, I think that that uh, that estimate's a little bit a uh, little bit low. Ninety-seven percent of teens. This comes from uh, Dr. Leonard Sachs in his book, *The Collapse of Parenting*. You want to read a good book on parenting? Uh, Sachs's book called *The Collapse of Parenting*. He's a pediatrician. He's a he's a uh, psychologist, a, a pediatric and, and, and pediatric pedi uh, pediatrician, pediatric psychologist and pediatrician. He writes in his book: ninety-seven percent of teens have electronic devices in the bedroom. And he says, that is an absolute no-no. In fact, he says, many of my colleagues are finally figuring out that what we're doing in treating a lot of young people in our culture is we're treating them for this diagnosis or that diagnosis. And he says, in many cases, and certainly not all, but in many cases, it's coming down to sleep deprivation. They're not getting enough sleep. Why? Because mom and dad go to their room, close the door. Junior goes to his room, closes the door, and it's on his phone until 3 o'clock in the morning. What do you expect? And Sachs's book is just eye-opening. And so our kids get plugged in, but at the same time they get tuned out at an alarming rate. And so peer world has replaced parent world as the number one influence in their lives. Now, you could argue successfully that to an extent that's always been the case. But in the 21st century, technology has changed all of that and taken it to a whole new level. And so somehow in some way as Christians, somehow in some way we have got to create an alternative culture for our kids. And there's only one place that will ever happen. And that's in your home and mine. In Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6. I want to show you three or four things in this text that I think is so vital to us. And I will tell you, everything we talk about this weekend is going to be, the principles are right here in Scripture. You don't, have to, you don't have to go outside of Scripture. You don't have to just throw a lot of psychology at people. Go to the Word. It's right here. Deuteronomy 6, verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Now come on down to verse 7. You shall teach them diligently to your sons. And talk of them. When? When you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. 
You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontals on your forehead. And you shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on the gates. By the way, you might just mark in your margin there, chapter 11, verses 18, 19, and 20, because Moses says the same thing in another sermon, Stephen says. It's almost word for word in chapter 11, what he says here in chapter 6, so it must be important. And so he turns to these parents and he says, here's, here's some homework. This is work that you have to do at home. You have to talk about these things. When they sit in your house, walk by the way, lie down, rise up. Every day is opportunities to teach. And he says, you've got to take it seriously. Raising our kids to learn about, to, to be respectful, to be responsible, to be young people of virtue and, and character and integrity and, and, and trust in God and all of those kinds of things are not some kind of extra credit assignment. That is the assignment. It is mandatory. Look in verse 1. How mandatory is it? Now this is the commandment, the statutes, and the judgments which the Lord your God has commanded me to teach you. How important is it, Moses? He says, God has commanded me to teach this to you. And this whole chapter is on parenting. And if God commanded Moses to teach it, then he commands us to teach it. Because as Moses and the children of Israel were going to cross the Jordan and enter into the promised land, surrounded by pagan cultures, then there's a message there for you and me. Because we're surrounded by pagan cultures too. Raising their kids to love and honor God first, rather than putting themselves first, is absolutely essential, Moses is telling them. Raising our kids to understand the world doesn't revolve around them it is paramount to their success in life. Raising them to embrace the principles that it's more blessed to give than to receive will equip them for life and give them a higher purpose and a higher calling than most people will ever understand. What is the meaning of life? Good question. It is the question. And I can tell you what it isn't. It's not how you look. It's not how many friends you have. It's not your GPA. It's not how athletic you are. It's not how musically inclined you are. That's not the meaning of life. The meaning of life gets down to the very end in which we say, are, are we raising our kids to, to connect with the Creator? That's what it's all about. And that's what Moses is telling them. In fact, if you look at verse 4, verse 5, verse 6, he says in verse 5, you, who's the you? Parents, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your might, these words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. Before he ever says anything, verse 7 and 8, about teaching them when they sit in your house, walk by the way, lie down, rise up. Before he ever says anything about that, he says, moms and dads, parents, you have to have it in your heart. You can't communicate to your kids something that you don't have. Kids can handle anything. They're resilient. I remember uh, Julie left me in charge of Luke when he was probably two. And the last thing she said to me was, make sure you keep the door to the basement stairs shut and locked. Because she said, he, he's been trying to open that door and he'll fall down those stairs. I said, oh, yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. So as a good dad and a two-year-old, you know, we were watching ESPN or something, I don't know. And a uh, ball game of some kind. The next thing I heard, I, I heard that door open. And the next thing I heard was kaplunk, 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 kaplunk. And I run running over there, and I thought, I'm a dead man. And I go running over there, and I look down at the bottom of the stairs, and there he was. He'd fallen down the stairs. And he got to the bottom of the stairs, and he just jumped up and said, come on, Dad. And I thought to myself, if I had fallen down the stairs, I would have broken everything. A kid can fall down the stairs and just pop right back up, and it's just, you know, no big deal. Kids are resilient that way. They just bounce back from so many things. But there is one thing a kid will never bounce back from. There's one thing a kid cannot handle. And that's hypocrisy. 
A child cannot handle hypocrisy, and a child can spot hypocrisy a mile away. One more thing about this passage. Look in verse 2. It's very interesting. Moses says, So that you and your son and your grandson, three generations, might fear the Lord your God to keep his statutes and his commandments. Moses talks to these young parents about their grandkids. And you know what's weird about that? Most of them didn't have any. If you know your Old Testament history, hopefully you understand the old folks have all died in the wilderness. Now, there were some age enough that they could have had grandchildren. I'm not saying they didn't. But I'm saying, by and large, Moses is talking to a pretty young group of people. Lots of moms and dads and kids. And, and he says, I want you to think about your grandchildren, he says. I want you to think about your kids and your kids' kids. Why? Why, why would it be important for a, a, a young couple with little kids to think about their grandkids? That sounds kind of strange. Why would that be important? Because in all probability, as life goes on, that's exactly what's going to happen. And Moses is saying to these young parents, what you do now may determine whether your grandchildren, who aren't even here yet, will know about God. So this whole chapter, this whole chapter, Moses is telling them, don't let culture take control of your family. Don't let that happen. And you and I have work to do. We have to shake off the shackles of complacency and this desire to just kind of fall in like everybody else. And, and, and work, and I, it takes work. Work to connect with them while we still have time to do that. Because time is short. So back to what Micah said. Are we teaching our kids? Are we, are we teaching them only about self-esteem? Or are we teaching them humility? It seems like we're going overboard with self-esteem. Now, some kids need that. But maybe what our kids need more is to teach them to be humble. I read this the other day, caught my eye. There was a third grade class of students in which the third graders were asked to describe themselves in three words, starting with I am. This one little boy wrote, I am awesome. I am special. I am a genius. J-E-A-N-I-U-S. Genius. I don't think self-esteem was his problem. So how do we do that? How do we take the teachings of Moses or Micah or any of the other verses we're going to look at this weekend and how do we, how do we get them off the page and into our families? How do, I, how do I teach my kids to live a humble life in an era of narcissism? How do I do that? How do I teach my children to be respectful of others in a culture of rank disrespect? How do I do that? All right, I'm going to leave you with five things. Five things. If you've got something to write on, I'm going to leave you with five things, and then we're going to be done. Five ways that we can apply all of this. I'm, I'm interested in information, but I am equally interested in application. So how do we take this information and actually apply it in realistic ways, in common sense kind of ways? And I'm not going to give you anything that's kind of out there. I think I'm going to give you some things that will be practical and real and helpful. Five ways that we can actually apply the teachings of Scripture at home with our children and with our families. Number one, the kids are going to love this one. Number one, write this down, one word, chores. Chores. Give your kids Chores. Require your kids to participate in age-appropriate chores. From the time they're quite young, they can learn how to pick up their toys, 
As they grow older, they can learn how to make up their bed. They can learn how to help mom set the table. As they grow older, they can, they can take on responsibilities with the family pet or vacuum or dust or mow the lawn or take out the trash or any number of things. You know, when our kids all turned 16, we always had a big to-do. It was a big deal. They're 16, and we'd have a big party and, and all that kind of deal. But they knew what was coming because they'd seen the others, you know, especially the younger ones. And so when they turned 16, we, eat, we gave each of them a key. We kind of a made-up key. We gave them a key to the washing machine. Because, you know, the kids always say, well, I wish you'd treat me like an adult. Okay. We give them a key to the washing machine. Because from the time they were 16, they're now going to be responsible for their own laundry. And it was amazing to me going to college how many kids my age in college had no clue about how to do laundry. I remember a girl, I remember a girl, <laughs> she got a garbage, a glad, one of these glad mega trash bags. She didn't want anybody to see her laundry, so she put all her clothes in a, in a glad, mad, big trash bag and put the trash bag in the laundry, tied it up put the trash bag in the washing machine. Yeah, a lot of good that does. So we were mean parents. We made our kids from the time they were 16 learn to do their own laundry. And it's amazing to me that kids can, can you know, if I don't understand something on something with technology, I just give it to a kid. Kids can figure it out quicker than I can. But suddenly here's an electronic device that they just have no clue about. <laughs> it's not that hard. Even I can do that. I know a mom, she was having trouble with her teenage son cleaning his room. And uh, he'd already told her he had to be at soccer practice at 3 o'clock and so, you know, that day. And she said, well, you need to clean your room, clean your room first. He said, okay. So it came about time to go, 2.30 or whatever. And he comes bounding down the stairs, and he says, Mom, I need to go to soccer practice. And she said, have you cleaned your room? And he said, no, I'll do it as soon as I get back. And she was sitting there reading a magazine, or pretending to, and she said, uh, uh, I only take boys to soccer practice who clean their room. And he said, oh, come on, Mom, come on, we're going to be late to soccer practice, let's go. And she said, maybe I didn't make myself clear. I only take boys to soccer practice who have cleaned their room. Mom, if we don't get to soccer practice on time, if I'm late, I'll have to run laps after practice. And she says, not even looking up this time, flipping pages. I only take boys to soccer practice who have cleaned their room. She said he turned around, went upstairs. And she said, I heard a sound I had not heard in a long time. It was the sound of a vacuum cleaner. And he cleaned his room. And he came downstairs, and she took him to soccer practice, and she said, and then I waited while he ran laps after practice was over. Lesson learned. That's a good mom. That's a good mom. What, what, are, what, what are parents doing when they do this? They're teaching life lesson 101, that you're not on planet Earth to be served, but you're here to serve and to contribute in some kind of way. And so from the earliest years in age-appropriate ways, they can be taught a little bit at a time. The value of serving. Chores. Number two, unplug those devices. Unplug those devices. I'm not saying all the time, but I'm saying you got to get some sense back into your lives and back into your home. The phone and social media and all can, can have a place, but not if it becomes an addiction. And I don't use that word lightly. It has become an addiction with so many people. And it's not just the kids. You ever been at a restaurant? Here's mom and dad and a couple of kids, and what are they doing? They're sitting there and they're talking and they're conversing as a family. Are you kidding? Dad's on his phone, mom's on her phone, the kids are all on their tablets or phones or whatever, and nobody says a word to anybody throughout the whole meal. And that's the way a lot of families live. That's the way a lot of families are. That's culture that's getting, that's coming in. 
I have some friends of mine that have, I think, four or five teenagers, and they have no Tech Tuesdays. I love that. No Tech Tuesdays. They have one day a week, we're not doing anything that plugs in. We're not doing it. And so in the summer, we cook out. We play games outside. In the winter, we, we uh, eat in and play games inside, hang out as a family. But no, no devices, no TVs, no phones, no tablets, nothing. I have a friend who runs a camp, and he says, you know, they, kids all have to turn in their phones. And he says, these kids, some of them go through withdrawals. He said, it's, it's like a drug withdrawal with some of these kids. And they actually have to learn to interact with real people. And FaceTime means something different. <laughs> you actually have to face-to-face -face with people. And some of our young people don't know how to do that. Because some of us parents aren't teaching them how to do that. <sighs> our oldest son has been in law enforcement for quite a while and one of his jobs is to work with parents and teens when it comes to the digital age and social media because he said so many kids get in so much trouble so quickly and uh, because he's a Christian he travels all over the country and does lessons in churches for uh, parents and kids on the parenting in the digital age and what to look out for and what's the latest and and all of that kind of thing and it's just tremendous valuable information but he said, invariably, he said, I'll go talk to the groups, you know, and somebody will come out and say, well, my son would never do that. My daughter would never do that. And he said, I just laugh. Doesn't the Bible say, don't be deceived, you know? Have we, have we who are older forgotten the pressure called peer pressure? It's tough being a young person these days. It's hard. And culture doesn't make it any easier. And the last thing I can do, the worst thing I can do, is hide my head in the sand and pretend like somehow my family is immune from all of this. We're not immune from this. Do not be deceived. Be careful in that area. Number three, eat together as a family. Eat together as a family. TV off, devices off. Sit down as a family as often as you can and eat together. The most important piece of furniture we have in our house is an oak table an oak kitchen table and we eat together as a family in the evening as often as we can and we gather together and we talk and we laugh and we rehearse the day and we act silly or whatever the case may be we just have fun and these kids we've adopted they never had that before they've never had a family before and it's the highlight of their day. They can't wait till supper when we all can sit down and be together as a family and every Monday night we journal we clear the table after we eat and everybody has a journal and we start writing, uh, today I feel, and they can write whatever they want after that point. And we all journal together for about 45 minutes and then we read our journal entries from the day. And here's an amazing thing. We've got a couple of other kids who have visited our home and they keep wanting to come back on Journal Monday. <laughs> they keep wanting to, I don't know, maybe it's because Julie's cooking or whatever the case may be, but they're, they're show, our, our table's getting full. But they said, you know, we want to we wanna journal. Amazing, isn't it? Eat together as a family. Number four, don't overschedule them. We do to our kids what we complain about ourselves. We overload. you got to help your kids learn some discipline. They can't do everything. They just can't. So they're going to have to be selective. And whatever they you select, make sure that it doesn't become their master. Because it can. It can steal their spiritual priorities. Something has to give when their lives are overloaded. And I think we probably know what that is or who that is. And last, get outside and do stuff together. Get outside and do stuff together. I heard of a dad who's having trouble with his teenage son. It was in the winter. And so the dad took some time off from work. School, the boy was off for Christmas vacation from school. And so he takes his son, they go to the mountains, to one of these ski resorts where they had one of these tubing runs. You rent tubes and go down and all that kind of thing. So he said, I just, I needed to connect with my son. I needed to spend time with my son. And so he said, we, we took off and he didn't want to go and he sulked all the way and he sat there with his earbuds in, head out the window, looking the other way, bored to tears. And he said, by the time we got there, I thought, what a waste of my time. 
He doesn't want to be with me. And so he said, we got out, rented our equipment, got our tubes, and we went up, you know, to the lift up to the top and, and uh, we started down together. And he said, we got to the bottom, and I thought, man, he said, I, I wish I could have done something else today. This, this is a waste. And he said, my boy got to the bottom, grabbed his tube, and took off running back to the lift. And he said, I'll beat you this time, Dad. And he said, the rest of the day was totally different. He said, we raced down those lanes. We had so much fun till we were worn out. We drove back home. He said, no earbuds this time. We just talked as dad and son. And he said, we had a blast. There's an inn in North Georgia, not too far from us, about 100 miles. And it's, it's called Hike Inn, H-I-K-E-I-N-N, Hike Inn. And you have to hike in five miles. Uh, it's level. That's the cool part, uh, because I, I can do it. And we hike in, and uh, they feed you supper, and don't worry about your cell phones. You don't get any coverage. And it's just, it's amazing how the kids love that. They love that kind of thing. Any of you play golf? Anybody play golf? Huh? Anybody? Yeah? Okay, I hate golf. But our youngest son loved it. I mean, that's what he did. He played high school golf for three years, loved it. And I had to learn that if I'm going to spend time with my son, I had to play golf. So here's what I did. I went down to play it again sports, and I invested a lot of money in a set of golf clubs, $99. I still have them, still use them. And uh, he and I started playing golf together. And we just had a blast. I only use Wilson golf balls because it's got my name on it. Because if I lose it, I already know which ball is mine. But uh, we'd be walking down the fairway, and I'd say, hey, there's my ball right next to yours. He said, Dad, you've hit yours twice. But I didn't care. we get to the end of the hole. He always kept score because he's really good. He keeps score, and he's kind of competitive. But we get to the end of the hole. He said, what would you shoot on that one? I said, five. we get to the end of the next hole. What would you shoot? Five. I always shoot five on every hole. It doesn't matter. So I can always say, at least I shoot 90, so there you go. But it was just having fun. That's all I cared about, just being with him. In 1995, I bought a 71 Chevy pickup. It was in primer gray. I paid $1,600 for it. And I brought it home. Some of you know Julie. She cried. She cried. She took one look at that truck, and she said, you paid $1,600 for that? I said, well, you know, we can paint it, and the, the, the engine's strong, and it's, it's going to be a great truck. Dale was 14 at the time, and that became his baby, and we would save a little money. We, paint, we painted it cherry red. We saved a little more money. We put new tires on it, got it fixed up, put straight pipes on that thing, put a new interior in that thing. He turned 16. I threw him the keys, and that's what he drove. He drove Big Red all through high school. And I told him, I said, the reason you went into law enforcement is because you spent so much time on the side of the road with law enforcement. <laughs> they kept saying, boy, when are you going to put a muffler on that thing, you know? But we lived in a little town at the time, and you could hear him all over town. So I knew where he was. Our daughter, Crystal, loved horses. We lived out in the country, and we got a, we got a Tennessee walking horse. We lived in Tennessee, and the horse was really old, and all she wanted to do was walk. And so I always called her a Tennessee walking horse. But that old horse was so good. But Crystal loved to go to the rodeos. And so we'd take her to the rodeos. And she'd come back and she'd try to barrel race that old horse. We had a couple of those big Rubbermaid trash cans. And so she'd put them out in the field. And she'd, she'd get on Half Moon, horse's name. She'd get on Half Moon. And she'd try to barrel race that horse around those Rubbermaid trash cans. And that horse, big old brown eyes, would look at me with a look that if it said anything, it says, please quit taking her to the rodeo. But that's what she liked. And so that was something we could do together. What am I saying tonight? I'm saying do whatever it takes. You got one shot. You got one shot. Don't blow it. We live in a crazy world. It's a crazy culture. And our kids need parents more than ever. They may not think they do, but they do. And it's up to you and me to be the parent. And by the way, and I'll just, this will end with this. Your job is not to be your daughter's girlfriend. That's not your job. Your job is not to be your son's best buddy. That's not your job. Your job is to be the parent. Somebody has to be the adult in the room. Somebody has to be the adult in the house. 
And that job falls upon me and you if you're a dad or a mom. Well, I hope some of these things have been helpful. We're going to talk about some things this weekend, some of which is in the book, uh, Co-Parenting with God. Some of these things are not in the book. I don't think this lesson's in the book. And so I hope we can say some things that will be helpful in some way, connect in some way, because I will just tell you, it's hard being a parent. It's hard being a parent anytime. It's hard being a parent today. It really is. We sing the song of encouragement. If you need encouraging, if we can help you in any way tonight, we'll be glad to do so. There's people who will sit and talk with you and study with you if that be your need. If you need to become a Christian, maybe you're a young person. If you're old enough to be a teenager, you're old enough to think about your relationship with God. Think about that. If we can help in some way tonight, in any way, please let us know. Won't you come while we stand and sing together?